Hey guys, Alan here. We're gonna be doing a little impromptu video because uh, the Andor trailer has dropped. Like, no one tells me any anything about what's going on. I'm a terrible Star Wars YouTuber, immediately. This is probably my fault. I should be on top of things better, but I, I generally don't do reactions to trailers because, let's be honest, they're never that exciting, but there's something about this Andor trailer, which I'll talk about a little bit more, I guess, after we watch it, that has got me really excited about something in Star Wars, even more than the Kenobi series, because you guys know I love Ewan McGregor and everything, but this series has got my interest peaked. Okay, let's take a look from the very beginning. Hammer guy. All right. You know, with all this technology, you'd think they would have an automated bell system, but that's what makes Star Wars kind of nice. It's in the future, but it's really not. Uh, so this cityscape looks really cool. Um, I'm always interested in new worlds and new cities. Um, the road structure itself kind of reminds me more of a sprawling, like Moss Eisley, Moss Espa kind of area. Uh, there's like no definition in the lanes, but it looks like a pretty large city and might be on a hill because the right side kind of looks like the slums you would see in Brazil, like the favelas maybe. Um, interesting. Guy's clearly pissed off here that he has to walk up these stairs every day, you know. There's like repulsor lifts. Okay, these kids are hiding. Uh, looks like the Amazon, actually. Okay, here we go. Let's take a look at this. Pause. That, to me, looks like a Pelta class. Uh, forget some kind of blockade runner you would see, like, during the Clone Wars. Pretty sure the Rebels used a few of these as well. Um, early on in the war. Interesting. I'm guessing that's Cassian, a young Cassian under. Okay. This is giving me Wally vibes. Love the orange on teal kind of look. Some kind of large scrap world of some kind. Let's see if we can distinguish anything here from the wreckage. It just looks like maybe en engine parts, old starfighters maybe. Uh, clearly some massive structures in the back. If you take a look at that, that almost looks like a Venator class Star Destroyer at least like the bridge area, and then to the left of that, that might be, I don't know, Luker Hulk. We, we can't tell by the, you know, distance and everything. And that looks like another engine assembly of a ship. Maybe it's Braca. I don't know. It's clearly a ship breaking uh, area, because as we all know, after the uh, Clone Wars ended, the Empire destroyed and scrapped a lot of these brand new, you know, three, four-year-old ships uh, to make way for the new Imperial uh, designs. Which, of course, is because of their military-industrial complex, which needs to make more stuff to generate more credits. This guy on the left is giving me Alan to Duck vibes a lot. The white lab coats, I'm guessing these guys are building um, something for the military, I'm guessing. Okay, we got back to these insurgents looking... Whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. These insurgents, are they using AKs? Look at this. This... That's essentially an AK-47. I mean, I'm sure it's gonna be a blaster, but that, you know, the charging handle on the right side, look at the barrel, uh, has no like compensator or anything. That looks like a, like a weird, it, the portions are a little weird. They obviously did something to them, but those are pretty much AK-47s. Okay. Perfect, perfect weapon for a Mujahideen or rebel fighter, I guess. Ooh, very cool. So these are, um, the successor to the LAAT, these are uh, Imperial, Imperial Dropships. I don't know exactly what the name is, because I'm pretty sure they come from Legends. Uh, Imperial Dropship. Oh, just called the Imperial Dropship Transport, or otherwise known as the IDT. Oh, they're considered an airspeeder, which is weird. Oh, so they're cheaper, apparently. They're cheaper than the original. LAATs, which kind of fits into the whole, let's produce a massive, cheap army that can patrol the entire galaxy. Uh, okay. I, I believe this uh, Starship was originally, originally came out in the Force Unleashed video game. I might be wrong about that, but let's, let's continue taking a look here. Okay, we got a bunch of guys. Looks like they're work they might be working in the scrapyard, because these clearly are engineers or some kind of scrappers. We're in the rubble, 
of either a recent crash or they're taking apart a new ship. They're a bit worried. Things are about to go down. It looks like that chick is just waiting uh, to carry out an ambush, you know, just like that Jedi ambush from Rogue One. I wonder if, if this uh, TV series is going to have more of a Rogue One vibe, you know. This is what's got me really excited because I think Rogue One did a great job at showing us what the average person was going through during this really crazy war, which is what I'm always interested in, much more than like the actual, you know, heroic characters like Luke Skywalker. Um, it's good to see what the normies are doing. Okay, talking about normies, who the hell are these guys? They look like maybe like some kind of local security force. Let me take a look at what the Baraka security force guys are actually, because they, they're they either planetary defense force, which I don't think that's what it is. They look like corporate defense almost, just judging by the colors and how how they look. Uh, let's see. Kind of what they were wearing on Baraka, the orange and the blue, but I guess that's what Cal Kestis and his, um, and his buddy was wearing in the beginning, so. I don't know, maybe this is Braca. Let's see. Okay, anyway, some kind of security force. They clearly are not the good guys here. They're clearly looking to detain people, uh, maybe on behalf of the Empire. Because remember, this uh, this series takes place about five years before the events of Rogue One. So this would have been at the height of the Empire um, as far as peace and stability, but they probably still needed these local corporate defense forces and planetary defense forces to keep order everywhere. Because even, even as large as the Imperial military was, they didn't have enough firm. All right, let's continue. Cassian Andor, young Andor, doesn't look that, that much younger uh, than he was before. Ooh, fat and satisfied. Ooh, I like this kind of humorous look of Imperial officers being incompetent, drinking their coffee. Very cool. Well, let's take a let's go back real quick. Usually, white uh, uniform. I wonder what this whole white kind of looking thing is because, uh, if I recall, white means either Imperial Security Bureau or uh, Imperial Intelligence. But I'm pretty sure Thrawn also had like a white Grand Admiral uniform. I don't know if this is maybe like a special weapons department. Th th this might be just like something related to the Death Star because, you know, Cassian and Andor came from Rogue One, which is really all about the Death Star. But maybe these guys are like scientists, who knows? Or at least, um, uh, you know, directors in the science program. The special, what is it called? What is the... The ISB and the I, Imperial Intelligence, they work together on this one program. Special Weapons? Oh, I, don't wanna, I think it's called the Special Weapon. There's so many. These kind of dictatorships always have so many different, very specifically named organizations. And it's hard to remember them all. Let's see. Okay. It was formed out of the Republic Special Weapons Group. That's where the special part came from. But yeah, okay. Imperial Military Department of Advanced Weapons Research which is where the Death Star laser program um, is carried out. Uh, if you ever read um, the Galen Erso novels, it talks a little bit more about that, and it's pretty exciting. I would, I would definitely check it out. Uh, okay, let's continue. Wait a second, so let me take a look at this guy. So if you take a look at this guy in the white uniform, he only has like blue bars. I wonder what that means, because usually there's like a mixture of different colors. I'm not 100% familiar with Insignia, Maybe this is some kind of more civilian type of ranking system, which is what the the ISB would have been. Or maybe he's just like a uh, a civilian scientist of some kind. All right, we got the rebels or insurgents running. Whoa. I love this kind of stuff. You guys know I love Eusebionopolis. I love Coruscant. I don't know what this is, but there's uh, the telltale... Uh, planetary air traffic there, you know, in those little lanes and lines. We did a video like a long time ago about how Coruscant's air traffic works. It's kind of crazy, but uh, it's good seeing those lines. This means this is a very packed and crowded city. Hopefully we'll get, uh, we'll get to explore that. Okay, here we go. So uh, we have some kind of Imperial officer. I'm guessing this is the special weapons group because those are deaf troopers behind her and deaf troopers are 
Are they Imperial Intelligence? They are Imperial Intelligence, but they're assigned to guard um, like high-ranking officers, uh, like including individuals like Director Krennic. So I'm guessing that this all has to do with the weapons group somehow. Um, let's see. Also, this this ship they're on, this does not look like a Lambda class. Is it a Lambda class? Maybe it's just black. Let's see what a Lambda class looks like up close. Okay, so that, that actually does look like a Lambda class shuttle. Yeah, the... Right, the wings are folded up so you can't see it, and those are the joints there. I'm gonna guess that's a Lambda class. Okay. Wait a second, let's look back at this scene right here. Okay, this probably is Coruscant. Probably. I'm excited if we're actually going to Coruscant. I know they've been trying to figure out this new uh, LIM technology with the big screens. But they gotta get away from Tatooine. Like, we've all been saying it, no more Tatooine. As much as we love Tatooine, use this technology, show us more cool stuff. Please, you know, spend some money, Disney. You guys are making so much freaking money right now. All right, so that looks like a really nice airspeeder, something uh, kind of like a Lincoln Town Car of some kind. They're watching me now. Ah, Chancellor Mon Mothai, how are you? Now it's interesting, like you have these actresses and actors now that you could just de-age by using cosmetics and I guess a little bit of technology. Um, I forget who this actress is, but she looks a lot younger than, oh no, she, this is not the same actress from the prequel, so sorry. So Mon Moth is played by two different actresses, I th and I think this is the actress who plays her in Rogue One. Some more mountain scenes, we've got some gorillas fighting. Yeah, that's an AK-47, dude. That's so funny because like, I know Star Wars weapons have always been built and based on real World War II weapons, but at least though they would put like a scope on it or like, you know, they would attach things. But this guy clearly has just an AK-47 and like the only thing that makes it look a little different is maybe the magazine has some like, you know, inlays in it and obviously the, the, the one stock is missing, but it the, the looks like there's some kind of folding arm action there. And then... This other guy here, is that another AK? That's so funny that they just have a bunch of AKs. <laughs> so I guess AK is is uh, synonymous with freedom fighters or guerrilla fighters in both our world and also their world. Good job, Kalashkinov. Okay. Soon enough. These days will. Ah, uh, it's Stellan Skarsgård. He's uh, he's in a lot of movies. You'll definitely recognize his face. He's like in Thor. He's in uh, he's in the recent Chernobyl series. He's uh, in Dune as the Baron in the remake of Dune. Ooh, these are really interesting. What is going on here? This looks like some kind of underwater base, which, why is the door above the water? And there seems to be some kind of suction thing going on. Maybe they're trying to hide like something underwater, like some kind of Death Star prototype, I don't know. Let's continue here, nice, okay. This might be inside the base. So each, these look like little pods here and they all have some kind of number next to it. Okay. There will be no rules going oh, forward. what is this? So we keep seeing these orange striped uh, white shirt guys. Don't really understand what's going on here. They, they seem to be workers. Could they be clones? I know in like, uh, you know, in Legends, they, they had different clone programs where they would try, like, alternatives to just having one, one you know, Django Fett-looking clone, and they would just, you know, try a variety of different types. But I don't think, I don't think that's what we're looking at. But this is definitely some kind of large facility underground. And I think it's tied to that thing we saw earlier. Uh, hold up, my laptop is going to... My laptop's going to die here. Let me get this in here. Interesting, okay. Maybe some ISB officer looking at Diego Luna's picture. All right. More of the banging of the drums. All right, we got another one of these officers. This looks like Mon Mothma, actually. Or it could be General Hux, I don't know. I'm just, not all redheads are the same. Okay, it's probably Mon Mothma. People are standing up. Oh, wait, wait, hold up, let's go back here. 
Interesting. Okay, oh, that's Imperial Army. So this looks like Imperial Army, by the way. Kind of like what uh, Han Solo was. They're not a branch of the military that we see often, but at least in Legends times, the the um, Imperial Army outnumbered the Stormtrooper Corps by a lot. Because, like, you know, Stormtroopers were kind of like this elite unit that was at the vanguard of every operation, or they'd be deployed on Star Destroyers, but when you took over world, you sent in these guys. Not as well trained, not as well equipped. The Imperial Army. That's a, that's a terrible sell for the Imperial Army. Um, okay. Ooh, wait a second. It's supposed to be five years before... If it's five years before Rogue One, this means this is going to be almost 14 years after the Clone Wars. But these are clearly Phase 2 Clone Troopers. I guess they're going to still be around? It'll be interesting. I, I, I thought they were phased out, but I guess it's possible that some would still survive. That's very cool. Okay, wow, nice. Explosion. Yeah, these, uh, these Corpo Planetary Defense Force guys are not doing well. Okay, we got a standard TIE fighter. Man, these cuts are so That's fast. Reckoning. Okay, Diego Luna's on a, some kind of a freighter, some kind of ship. Okay, nice. That's what a reckoning sounds like. That's what a reckoning sounds like. No sight of Forrest Whitaker, by the way. But that's fine. That's fine. All right. Yeah. Um, okay, so the reason why I wanted to react to this is because I am very interested in the world building that Star Wars has. Again, I, I've never been that interested in the individual storylines. Um, you know, like I don't really care what the Jedi and the Sith are doing with their massive struggles. I, I love the books, I love the novels, I love the in-between parts of what it's like to live in the Star Wars galaxy. And I think like what's been missing from uh, Star Wars is like we have these huge moments, the Galactic Civil War, the Clone Wars, Order 66, and we never really get to see what it's like to live in between those moments as an ordinary person on the ground. Because uh, I think when you're at that level, things are not necessarily as black and white. Uh, you're not going to see the struggle between Yoda and Palpatine. You're just going to be worrying about your next meal and not getting killed by, you know, one of the factions. And I, and I think, judging by this, uh, just this trailer, it seems like this is going to be focused a lot on uh, Diego Luna's uh, Cassian Andor and... Uh, I'm guessing the world he grew up on before he joined the rebellion. So I, I, it'll be interesting to see like the beginnings of the rebellion as like people become more and more angry about the empire's rule. Like, there's a reason why Mon Mothma is here. By the way, she is um, considered by many like the heart of the rebellion. I know Princess Leia and Luke Skywalker are considered like the heroes of the rebellion, but Mon Mothma is the individual. She kept everyone together. And everyone really focused on the larger mission of essentially inspiring other people to join the rebellion, which is a really important uh, part of the equation. Because on the other end, you have like guys like Saw Gerrera who just want to kill as many Imperials as possible. And ultimately, no matter how many tactical victories he could create, uh, he would lose because you can't fight the Empire with fire. You have to show people that the Empire is, a, is essentially a bad you know, government system, and there are alternatives. Um, what was I saying? What was I saying? Something important. Uh, Cassian Endor, blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah, so the other thing that should be cool is Cassian Endor is actually a Separatist. He was a Separatist during the Clone Wars period. Um, so I don't know if we'll see, like, flashbacks of him fighting clones, because we did just see clone troopers, which is really interesting. We have never seen clone troopers... Um, in live action before. We've seen them digitally made in the prequels, but those were, like, not live action. So that'll be really cool to see them physically. But I wonder if this has something to do with Diego Luna's past as a Separatist. But because he's a Separatist, this also means he's going to be in an Outer Rim world, most likely some kind of heavy, heavily industrialized or rapidly industrialized world because, uh, uh, you know, obviously the Empire's big moves in those early, early days once they took over was the nationalization of raw resources and an expansion of the military industrial complex. Like the only way 
you can afford to field a gigantic galaxy-wide military force is by scaling things up and subsidizing things at a huge level. That decreases the cost of individual units, and uh, it'll also help if you standardize things, it'll be much cheaper to provide, you know, helmets and equipment and all these other kind of things. So clearly Diego Luna, I mean, why do I keep saying his real name, sorry. Uh, Cassian Endor is on one of these more pivotal worlds, kind of like Lothal, uh, which had a lot of also like heavy manufacturing raw resources, and it'll be really cool to see uh, what's going on there as these rebels carrying AK-47s. <laughs> it's going to be fun seeing like blaster bolts come out of AK-47s. <laughs> but it, it'll be really cool to see like just the, the beginning and the growth from the ground up. I, I, I always really loved this part of Star Wars. And I'm so happy they, they've decided to go this route. Um, because clearly Star Wars has a large enough of a fan base that people are actually interested in these kind of things. Um, like you and me. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed uh, my little breakdown. Um, I'm excited for this. We also have Kenobi coming out. i uh, like, wow, it's a good time to be a Star Wars fan, finally. It's been a while. All right, see you guys in the next one.